Coming up on today's show, stocks rip higher across the board on the back of soft inflation data, why some say the rally is just beginning, what Michael Burry's betting against, and the asset that JP Morgan says is your best bet for next year. Stick with me, guys. I've got a good one for you today. Let's go. Welcome back to the Click Capital Daily Market Show, everybody. I'm your host, Jared. I hope you're doing well. And what a day it was on Wall Street. See a green across the board as a strong technical rally continues. On the back of that soft CPI report, stock market absolutely loving that, especially yield sensitive sectors like utilities, REITs, and financials had a great day. On the back of falling yields helping out their balance sheets, tech did good and small caps were the winner, but mega cap tech, while they finished higher, they're a bit softer than the rest of the group. And we did see a little bit of weakness in healthcare. Otherwise, there was a lot of bullish breadth across the board. We can see that on the daily chart, the S&P 500. Actually getting a little bit above 4,500 today to finish at 4,495 up almost 2%. NASDAQ was up over 2% today as well. And we're now within a point of making new year-to-date highs on the queues. But the winner today was microcaps up 5.5% and the Russell 2000 up the same on huge volume. And if you've been watching my channel the last couple of weeks, you've been hearing me talk about how cheap small caps and microcaps had gotten. And I've been increasing my exposure in my own personal portfolios to small stocks. There's a lot of bargains out there for the long-term patient investor. And once again, it was option dealers that saw the move ahead of time. It's actually almost two weeks ago. They dropped their implied volatilities below realized, sending volatility risk premium into negative territory, where it is today. And so option dealers had been banking on the Santa Claus rally coming early, which it has. And that's thanks to some sharp drops in government bond yields with a two-year fall in a massive 20 basis points today, down to 483. And the 10-year fall in 19 basis points, down to 445. It's only three weeks ago, we we're at 5%. A lot of volatility in the bond market, but stocks are loving it. That helped send TLT up to a six-week high today. And we saw some huge huge moves in some beaten down sectors like clean energy up 8.2% today. Retail up almost 5% on volume. Home builders up 5.88% on huge volume. Same with airline companies up 4.77. And one of the best performing sectors today, regional banks up 7.36%. Along with other yield sensitive sectors like REITs up 5.4. And stick with me because after I take you through all the news and data will come back and dive into the charts and see what else we can find out there. So we just got the most important piece of economic data for the month, consumer price index, CPI inflation data, with the headline rate expected to grow 3.3% year over year, came in slightly lower, 3.2%. And same with core inflation, coming in slightly lower than expected at 4% year over year growth. And month over month was actually flat on headline. And so that's got the market very excited that that is now the end of the Fed rate hikes. And we can see that in the Fed fund futures market. Now pricing an almost 100% probability that the Fed is done. They're only given a 0.2% chance we may see another hike. And now actually given almost a one in three chance they may cut rates come March. And so if you've been watching this channel every day, you know that the Fed and the market was unsure whether they're going to hike again, given about a one in four, sometimes one in three chance we may see another hike in December come January. But the market's now saying for sure that the Fed is done. And we did see this after the regional bank crisis back in March. Very similar odds that the Fed was done. As a thought then that the regional banking crisis would tip the economy into a recession within six months, which it had been destined for anyway. However, the economy held up really well and the market repriced its chances of some more Fed rate hikes, which we got in July. So the market's now assuming that CPI is going to keep trending down. And even though headline CPI increased 3.2% year over year, looking underneath the hood, there's still some big increases in individual items. For example, frozen vegetables up 10.7%, beef steaks up 10.6%, sugar up 8.8%, baby food and formula up 8.3%. And here's a funny one for you, admission to sporting events up 25% year over year, vehicle insurance up almost 20%, vehicle repair up 15%. And what's helping inflation again is the fall in the price of crude. After we got up to almost $95 a barrel in late September, here we are today at $78 a barrel. And crude oil is the biggest volatile variable in inflation, the driver behind a lot of goods and services. And so if oil were to keep continuing trending down, that's going to continue helping inflation. But more on commodities a bit later on. And so now we've got the stock market breaking out again, bunch of bullish technical signals all over the place. After doing a swig breadth thrust last week, where we went from significantly oversold to overbought in really quick fashion, and we've extended that today with more than 90% of volume coming in on the advancing stocks versus less than 10% on declining stocks. And love them or hate them, fact is, Fundstrat's Tom Lee's nailed it this year. He called for a big rally today, which he got right as well, and he thinks it's going to continue as inflation may have just hit a wall, saying only 7 of 31 core CPI components saw a rise in October. Wow, this should drive a change in both the Fed's view of, of the stickiness of inflation and also the market narrative. So now him and all the bulls are basically banking on the soft landing or even no landing scenario. 
kind of the Goldilocks sweet spot for the stock market. And it's true, looking back in history, stocks can rally after the Fed goes on pause, and they don't typically fall until the Fed starts cutting when they see immediate trouble right in front of them. Like I said, we just saw some huge surges in some sectors today on really big volume with real estate and home builder stocks, some of the leading sectors today. As yields had their biggest fall in eight months, and that makes these dividend paying stocks a lot more attractive. Even bank stocks ripped higher today and usually higher rates are good for bank stocks as it increases the spread in which they can charge out money versus what they have to pay depositors. However, it is a little bit different this time because back in the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of government stimulus, deposits at banks shot up huge and loans come down. So what banks did with all that excess capital was buy treasuries when they were yielding rock bottom rates around 1%. And so they've got huge unrealized losses on their balance sheet, which is a big systemic risk. And so today we saw a bit of easing of that pressure with yields dropping and their losses contracting for now. And something that stood out to me today was even though the stock market had a really good day up 2%, we haven't seen too many of them this year. Small stocks absolutely smoked large caps today, putting in their best day up over 5%. That's a huge move. And like I've been saying for a little while now, I think small caps are set to outperform because there's a huge valuation spread between smalls and bigs. And the Magnificent 7 is a very concentrated trade. And that's why I've been picking up a few small caps on the cheap lately. And the market may be waking up and starting to agree because I've got Bank of America coming out today saying battered small cap stocks look like a buy. They're at their cheapest level in 14 months. And we can see that here in this chart of the relative forward PE between the Russell 2000 and the Russell 1000. Going back to 1985, it's only a little bit lower come the late 90s when the stock market went into a bear market. For the first three years of the new millennium, value stocks and small stocks outperformed and we're at similar levels today. So we get to hear from the Fed again two weeks before Christmas and they may come out and announce they're officially on pause and kind of pave the way for their next move to be cutting rates, possibly come March or April. I'd say they need to see a big uptick in unemployment, some real weakness out there along with CPI continuing down. And we have seen some falls in things like shelter prices, but keep an eye on oil. If we keep seeing oil going down, that's gonna keep pulling inflation down, help do the Fed's job for it. And I'd say that's got Jay feeling pretty good right now and feeling close to announcing mission accomplished. However, contrasting that view is the man on the other side of your Robin Hood trades, Sidell's Ken Griffin, saying the Fed's credibility is at risk if it cuts interest rates too soon. Telling Bloomberg today, the Fed needs to have the message that they will put the inflation genie back in the bottle. He sees inflation as stubborn. He even warned last week that higher baseline inflation may go on for decades, caused by structural changes that are pushing the world towards deglobalization. And the market didn't seem to care that Moody's downgraded the outlook for US debt, and same with Janet Yellen, saying she disagrees with Moody's downgrade, as the economy is strong and treasuries are the preeminent safe asset. And you may be wondering, why did we see such a huge rip in long dated yields over the last couple of months when inflation's been coming down? The market's pretty much thinking the Fed is done. Stocks are holding up well. Well, I think this chart has something to do with it, and that's showing over 8.2 trillion in US federal debt maturing over the next 12 months. That's about a third of all outstanding treasuries that the Treasury Department has to refinance over the next year on top of about a $2 trillion budget deficit. That's the difference between what the government makes and spends that they'll also have to finance. That's an all-time high. And basically long-dated bond yields have been front-running that huge amount of supply coming on. At the same time, the three biggest buyers of treasuries over the last 15 years, Japan, China, and the Fed are all stepping back. So we've got increased supply, decreased demand. The only thing that can really overwhelm that in the short and medium term is a recession. However, for now, we could be in that sweet spot of yields pulling back and stocks still being able to rally for a few months, going into some real weakness in the economy, possibly in Q2, Q3 next year. But looking at the other side of the coin, we've got a technical bearish signal on the Dow Jones. Just seen the dreaded death cross. The last time we saw that was back in March last year, then the Dow fell 12% over a six month period. And that's basically when the 50 day moving average and this yellow line here goes below the 200 day moving average and this purple line here, which on close today, we got that signal come through, even though the market ripped up. We also got everyone's favorite bear, big short investor, Michael Burry, revealing a bet against Nvidia and other microchip stocks. And he's been warning us of the everything bubble for a good year or so now, and he continues to bet against it. He does carry long positions, but after closing his put positions on the S&P 500 and the queues in the second quarter, he's now got puts on the semiconductor ETF, thinking that semis are overcooked here. And just looking at a weekly chart of the semiconductor ETF MSH, we actually closed at an all time high today, up 3%. And there's a look at a three month chart. Still possible that this could be a double top. However, we could easily rally for another couple of months and end up turning it into a head and shoulders pattern with that being the left shoulder 
Maybe we're about to make a head and then we could come up and make a right shoulder. Moving on to commodities, oil markets could shift into surplus early next year as demand growth slows and non-OPEC plus producers lead supply growth. As this year we've seen record supply from countries like US and Brazil. And next year, supply is expected to climb to 103.4 million barrels a day, overtaking demand of 102.9 million barrels a day. That at a time that demand growth is also slowing, still got a lot of weakness in major economies around the world, and market perceptions of supply disruptions coming out of the Middle East really subsiding. So I wouldn't be surprised to see the Saudis and Russians come out with more production cuts going into next year to try and counter all that. And we've got an analyst from JP Morgan saying the best bet for next year won't be stocks or bonds, it'll be commodities. And that's JP Morgan's chief market strategist, Marco Kalanovic, who has put himself firmly in the year without a Santa Claus camp as he repeats his recent warning that the recent equity rally is out of steam. He went on to say that the sharp decline in oil prices over the past month is making us more positive on energy, both as a geopolitical hedge and given lighter positioning. And that pullback in yields today saw a drop in the dollar, which helped gold post its biggest daily gain in nearly a month. And that's helping gold as the opportunity cost for long-term investors falls along with the financing cost for speculative traders. And we can see that on the daily chart. Got a nice bounce off the 50-day VWAP, getting up to 19.75 an ounce today. And we may come back up and start flirting with these all-time highs again, a bit above 2,000 an ounce. Also possibly helping the markets today is the likelihood of cooling geopolitical tensions. With leaders of the world's two biggest economies, US and China, meeting together as we speak. First time a US president's met with Xi Jinping in seven years. With close watcher of the relationship, billionaire Ray Dalio, saying while this stepping back from the brink is a great step away from the worst type of war, it is not an end of war. Rather, there is a shifting to a different type of war. The goal of both sides in this new type of war is to win without getting into a bloody military war. And that's nothing new. Ever since COVID, we've seen the rise and rise of the economic cold war between US and China. However, I agree with Ray. It's probably unlikely to spill over into a full-blown World War III, as the US and the West as a whole still has leverage over China. And I don't think Xi wants to threaten his rule by getting into a full-blown war with the West. He's happy to kind of just play both sides with Russia getting cheap energy and still being able to sell a lot to the Americans and keep his economy ticking over and a lot of people employed as internal social stability is his number one mandate. So that cooling of geopolitical tensions could likely be helping stocks here as well. Looking at economic data today, we got some GDP growth rate year over year out of the eurozone coming in 0.1 percent still pretty much flatlining growth we'll get gdp growth rate data out of japan in 46 minutes after i finish speaking along with a bit of data out of china in a few hours and some more inflation data out of europe tomorrow along with retail sales from the states surprisingly after this rip roaring rally in stocks we've still got the fear and greed index in the neutral zone at 47 and that's thanks to stock price strength net new 52 week highs and lows on the nyse is still in fair territory and the mcclellan volume summation index still in fear along with the difference in 20 day stock and bond returns. So still a bit more work underneath the hood with breadth for this market to really get bullish. And yeah, a little bit of strange action and in corporate insider activity yesterday. We've got a surge in both the amount of purchases and sales. With sales only coming in slightly higher, 220 to 166. Normally a bigger gap than that. And looking at my institutional buying percentage indicator, that's just slightly in the neutral zone, 45%. Once it goes below 45, that'll be into the bearish zone. Last time we saw that was back in early September around here. Then more so in the middle late July around here. And with the S&P 500 oscillator showing a huge 65.21 reading. So we're getting into overbought territory, but like we saw back in June, it can stay overbought for a number of weeks before we do eventually roll over. So I'm not calling a short term top here, but we could be getting close to one. And we can see that in my regular daily chart as well. The S&P 500 just touching the top of its buy sell band today, which is at 4506. And we've got a little bit of a resistance zone around that 4520 level. The next level after after that is the year to date highs made on the 27th of July at 4607. So just above 4600. And I'd say we'd very well this week, possibly next week could come up and test this bearish engulfing candle here that's been holding for the last couple of months. Also my dynamic swing index indicator, that's just went into overbought territory today at 11.93. Have the hidden divergence indicator is really strong at 3.66. That, along with my reversal signals, nailed that short-term low, and we've had a really good rip here. And like I said, it was a Russell 2000. That was just an absolute standout today. But stick with me, because I'll come back to the main US indices at the end of this video, like I always do. Looking across international stock markets, they had a great Tuesday as well. Germany's DAX ripping up, trying to almost to back above the 50. Nikkei getting back up close to year-to-date highs, and a nice little bounce above the trend line in the ASX 200 as well. Absolute volatility crush. VIX now just above 14. Even got the NASDAQ's VIX 
VXN coming down to multi-month lows at 17.8. And no surprise at all, today was a huge day in the options market. 47.2 million contracts traded and a whopping 57% of them calls, which has sent the put core ratio back down to 0.81. And look at short-term breadth, 84% of stocks above their 20-day average, something we haven't seen since July. And a big rip up in medium-term strength, 67% of stocks above their 50-day. And we're almost back above half of stocks above their long-term average. And something we haven't seen for a while, it's a good spread between new highs and new lows. 104 versus 5 on NYC and a bit of a breakout there on the NASDAQ as well. 97 stocks making new highs versus 27 new lows. Got the growth versus defensive sectors breaking out, but not so sharply. They already are in overbought territory. We did see the big move in high beta stocks versus low volatility. Spread between those two up 3%. And look at that, the spread between Q's and Russell. Sharp fall today down 3% as small cap stocks have absolutely smoked tech and large and break out in high yield bonds along with investment grade as well. There's a sharp fall in, in the dollar index futures on volume with those increase in yields and that's a really bearish technical pattern right there. Could easily spill over for the next couple of weeks and that'll be a further tailwind to stocks as well. But that risk on sediment and pullback in the dollar didn't help crypto at all. Bitcoin's now back down into this previous resistance zone. And we'll just have to see whether this holds and turns into new support. Not a whole lot going on in the commodity index as a whole, with crude pretty much flat. Agricultural commodities still up at this big resistance zone, with things like orange juice, sugar, and coca still near multi-year highs. Over to stock sectors, and just turning on my sector trends table indicator. What a splash of green it is. Every single sector above their five-day moving average, and all except three above their 20-day moving average, and that's energy, oil, and gas, and gold miners. And that's pretty much the mirror opposite of what we saw about a month ago. They were the standout sectors, so they're really trading separate from the market. And we've got most sectors now back above their 50-day medium-term trend, but we've still got more than half of sectors below their 200-day long-term moving average. So like I said, still a bit more technical work for the stock market to get really bullish and to break out before we can really start saying we're back into a bull market. And just looking at stock sectors, it was only the cannabis sector that, that fell lower today. There's the big move up in semis, but we're really technically overbought here, but they did break out. So we'll see whether this holds. It's a genuine breakout or potentially a fake out. And like I said, those yielding sectors like utilities up 4% today and dividend stocks, which are normally really low volatility. They finished the day up over 3% after putting in this nice double bottom on bullish divergences. And then one of my favorite stocks to watch for the health of the stock market, and what I call the BlackRock barometer, as their custodian to the largest part of the stock market. Big day today up 5.4%, really strong price action there. But mega cap tech as a whole was pretty subdued compared to the rest of the market. Apple up 1.4, Microsoft wasn't even up 1%, really technically overbought here. Not really showing a bearish divergence on the DSI yet, maybe a little one on hidden divergence. My reversal signals indicator is firing off, so we could be due for a bit of a pullback on Microsoft. Google's climbing up and Nvidia close to breaking out to all time highs here. But Again, we're at the top of this resistance zone, really technically overbought. So it's got some big work to do from here to break out. And we've got earnings from them this time next week. Amazon as well broke out to new year-to-date highs. And Tesla looking to close that earnings gap after that really bad earnings a few weeks ago. Still have to get above the close of this day, which is 2.42. And we're only five points away from that. So it'll be really interesting to see if Tesla can hold this gap. There's Meta as well breaking out to new year-to-date highs. Netflix still got a little bit of work to do. And AMD is coming back from a lot of softness over the last couple of months. Some previous stock market leaders this year, Super Microcomputer had a great day up 14.8% on volume. And no surprise, some big moves in the meme space. Virgin Galactic up 12%, Carvana up 15 Peloton up 15 along with the other EV makers and Snap. Got some sharp moves higher today in high beta stocks. Also got earnings out from Home Depot coming in pretty much in line with what was expected. Market seemed to really like that up 5.4%. And some pretty good moves in those Beaten down old economy stocks we've been watching. General Motors up 4.8. Walgreens looking to get back into that support at up 4.6. Sharp bounce for Macy's up 9.2. We'll get to hear from them on earnings in two days. And 3M breaking out multi-week highs. The telecoms a little bit more softer. And look at those moves in those vulnerable regional banks really sharply up today on volume. Even the bank guys, Bank of America up really strong along with Citigroup, Wells and Charles Schwab a little bit more softer. Okay, back to the S&P 500. Got the third reversal signal in a row. You can see my range strength is 1.6, which means there's not so much momentum in the market over the last couple of months, but it's not quite ranging. It's kind of in a middle ground, but this sharp technical bounce 
can't be ignored. And moves like that in the short term can bode well for the medium term. And I'd say at the minimum, it could lead to some more sideways pattern for the next couple of months. And I would not be surprised if we come up and test year to date highs at 4607 right around here, maybe this week or next week. And we're really looking to see whether we reject off that high from that bearish engulfing or whether we can close above it and then keep ripping. Because it was only a couple of weeks ago, we were down at 4100 and here we are almost at 45. It's a 400 point rip in a little over three weeks. And I really like the move off the bottom from the Russell 2000 and Smalls. After putting in this big bullish divergences, it's a good chance this may be a bottom at least for a couple of months and we could get a big catch up trade in small caps. And just looking at the mega cap eight, they're just a few points as a whole from breaking out into new year to date highs as well. So quite the bullish move in the stock market today. It's a real strong reaction to that CPI only coming in a little less than expectations. But look at that move and yield, especially up the front, the two year just diving now close to multi month lows. And so while we may see further falls and short dated yields, I'll be watching the 10 year. I'd expect this to go back into sideways pattern. Until we see some real weakness in the economy, I'd be surprised to see the 10 year going under 4% anytime soon. Because like I said before, a lot of issuance from the Treasury over the next year, along with big buyers stepping back, should help to keep long dated yields higher. But for now, it looks like all that bullish seasonality is playing out. And seasonality has really been playing out all year. Just about every historical pattern has been just coming in as expected. And we'll just have to see whether this continues into Christmas. I do expect we'll come up and test 4600. We may break above that. How I'd say it's likely we may just go back into a bit of consolidation between 4,600 and 4,400 for the rest of the year. That's all for today. Thanks very much for tuning in to Click Capital Daily Market Show. You may have noticed I didn't do a show yesterday. That's because for the rest of the year, I'm not going to do shows on Mondays for a couple of reasons. The first being I need a bit of extra time to work on my online course that I've got a target date of releasing on January 15. Something I've been working on for a couple of months and I'm putting a lot of effort into because that's going to be a monster something that's been requested from me more than anything else. Also, Mondays tend to be a real quiet day in the markets. We don't have a lot of economic data. News flow and journalists are just getting back to the desk. There's not a lot of content out there. And like yesterday, it's often a small range day with not much to talk about. However, if we do get a big move on Mondays, I'll do a show. Otherwise, for the rest of the year, you can expect to see a show from me every day, Tuesday to Friday by 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time. Once again, thanks for tuning in and all your support, and I hope to see you again tomorrow night. Cheers.